Yeah. So <laughs> you, you just, you, you find a way, um, and, and it takes, it does take a little bit of extra effort. Right. Um, but those connections to me are important and, and it's not even doesn't necessarily have to anything to do with a, a professional network. But I mean, these are people that I care about. Right. So you do have to take the, um, you know, the extra step and go the extra mile to maintain those connections. Um, you know, and, and, you know, my friends and, and, and colleagues also back home, they also reach out to me every once in a while. Just, hey, how you doing? What's going on? Um, and, and just to make sure that I also don't feel out of sight, out of mind. Right. And that's something that, that's really appreciated from my side is, is it's not just a one way street. Um, you know, they're they're also trying to check back with me and, and, and make sure that I'm OK. Um, but it, it, it takes effort and you, you have to be deliberate about it um and even if you set something you know in your mind or in your calendars like every six months from even from a professional perspective i need to send emails to these people <laughs> right um just to kind of keep that keep that going so that you know partially you know the other thing is when it's when you deem it time to return you need to be able to leverage those people to get you back right um and then to keep an eye out for you in terms of opportunities and all that so you know, I, I learned, I think, very early on that the time to engage a network is not when you need something. Sure. Right. Because by then it's already too late. If, if somebody, if you're asking somebody out of the blue that you haven't talked to in two years, oh, yeah, I need you to do me this favor. They're like, well, wait a minute. I haven't talked to you in two years. Right. Um, so they, they need to be aware and abreast of the types of things that you're doing. Um, so they it can be in a better position to understand what it is you're doing, what you're looking for, and how they can potentially help you um, in the next moves that you're trying to make. Variety, you know, the typical kind of business greeting, right, is to shake people's hands. Um, but here, you have to be patient with that, particularly with, with Middle Eastern women, Muslim women, um, because some of them will not, you know, they, they may kind of gently bow to you or nod their head, um, but they're not going to shake your hand because you're a man and they're just not supposed to, based upon their kind of cultural or religious beliefs, do that, right? Mm -hmm. So I found oftentimes I was kind of automatically sticking my hand out there because it was my normal way as an American of greeting people, right? Um, and I had to learn, let me wait and see as I'm introduced to women, let me see what they do, right? And so I wait for them to extend their hand if they don't. That's no offense to me. I just kind of, you know, nod my head or in acknowledgement. Um, but that, that was something that, that took getting used to. Um, and, and sometimes I still make the mistake. And as for as long as I've been here, and I just kind of reflexively, you know, stick out my hand. And, and now we're even in the kind of times of, of COVID and, and nobody's really shaking hands anymore, but I still do it. Right. Um, so I, I think those types of things and those, those nuances are, um, you know, are very important. Body language, I think, is is um, universal. I, I think you can tell when people aren't engaged or they're slouching or they're upright or they're attentive and they're leading into listening. So I think that doesn't necessarily change, um, you know, really from, from a cultural perspective. Um, the, the the personal space thing is, is certainly, um, you know, very different. You know, I mean, Americans really believe in our personal space and here in uh, you know really everywhere I've gone outside the U.S. they don't care. Right. So you have a very large Indian population, Sri Lankan population, Filipino population that have really over the last forty to fifty years built this country um, and and have been responsible for for what it is today. Um, so you you also have to get used to those different cultural intersections. I mean, and you'll find you know, probably as many Arabs here in this region that speak some form of Hindi um, as well as Arabic because of the amount of, of people who have come over to this region from India um, in order to, to work. Um, so, and you also see a very interesting, um, you know, aspect where people who were born, raised, and still live in UAE who are not UAE citizens, right? So at least in America, you have this birthright citizenship. Um, but here in the Gulf, that is not the case. You, and as you become an adult, your residency is tied to your employment. So think about if you grew up someplace your entire life and that's all the thing you know is home, but then you lose your job one day. 
you have to go back to the country that your passport is from. Now, you may have visited that place. You may, you know, have family there, right? But that's a place that you don't really know. So imagine, you know, growing up in, in Dubai, you know, and you're 30, 35 years old, you lose your job, you can't find another one, and then you have to go back to India. And you're like, wait a minute, this makes no sense to me, right? So you start to understand all these different kind of cultural nuances um, and how they interact as you kind of get up to speed, um, you know, but it, it certainly is just a smattering of multiculturalism and you, you know, start to understand accents, um, you, you start to understand working styles, um, you know, and, and how you try to get the best out of people, you know, based upon their approaches to work that may be very different from, from yours.